Now, seven months after the World Health Organization declared COVID-19 a pandemic, the coronavirus continues to rage across the globe, infecting tens of thousands of people in its wake every single day. Many have been pinning the hopes of ending the public health crisis on successful vaccine development, and now more than 180 vaccine projects are taking place globally, according to Nature, with about 42 in the process of testing their drugs on human volunteers. Of course, we don't know when a working vaccine or vaccines will emerge, but hope has been growing as more and more people volunteer for clinical trials and governments prepare to produce and distribute them on a massive scale. At the same time, there are a growing number of questions and concerns over whether they will work, the possible side effects, and whether they could even endanger your life after the death of a volunteer in Brazil next week, uh, last week. We address these issues today, and I'm joined by Barat Pankania, Senior Clinical Lecturer at the University of Exeter Medical School. Thank you so much for joining us at a terribly Thank inconvenient you. hour in the UK. That's okay. We also connect with Albert Coe, Professor of Epidemiology and Medicine at Yale School of Public Health. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you very much, Fu Young, for the invitation. Well, my first question goes to you, Dr. Pankania. Now, before we begin, there are many different kinds of vaccines being developed around the world, more than 180, and it's really hard for a non-scientist to really differentiate between them. So, first of all, what are the key differences between some of the leading candidates that we're seeing, like AstraZeneca and Moderna, and do these differences really matter? Well, thank you. So it is really good to see that the scientists all over the world, it's really, really pleasing that we have scientists in the United States, Europe, Far East, China, Japan, India, all developing a vaccine with a different um, uh, method to, to, to how to make it. So, for example, the Moderna vaccine, I would call it a genetic vaccine. What that does is it introduces through what we call the RNA, that's a, that's a code. That's a code to tell the human body. So it puts the RNA on a virus that's not going to make you ill, and then it is injected inside you, and then it orders the body's own DNA to make more of the coronavirus proteins. And then the body's uh, immune system recognizes these proteins and makes immunity against it. So that's the uh, Moderna vaccine. The AstraZeneca Oxford one is also very similar, but slightly different. And the slight difference is we call it a vector vaccine. What that is, is we put the uh, coronavirus genetic code, RNA code, only bits of it, not the whole of it, on another virus. So another virus carries it into the body and then slowly makes um, new viral proteins against which the body's immune system will recognize it and make immunity and prepare the person to fight the real coronavirus infection if and when they encounter it. But it's all very good news that scientists are all working on making a vaccine using different components and different technologies like live attenuated viruses, killed viruses, killed proteins, and the range is very diverse and very pleasing to hear about. I suppose it's very important to have the different methods being tried out as serious as this virus is. And well, Dr. Pankania, so scientists at Imperial College London, they said they plan to uh, infect vaccinated volunteers really early next year with the coronavirus to see how they respond to it. And well, how effective have these human trial challenges been before? And is it going to help with COVID-19? Oh, it will help. The, the, <laughs> the problem is, we want to know if the vaccines are what we call immunogenic, meaning do they produce good immunity? And then the second bit is, is the immuno immunity long lasting? So it's two things. Do they work? Meaning do they produce immunity? We do know that, that they do. Then the second bit that we are not 100% sure about is how good is the immunity? And the th third bit that I also want to add is how long does the immunity last for? And then finally, one more point, which is also very, very important, is these vaccines must be tested in all the age groups, especially in the vulnerable age group. Because remember, we want to immunize people in the vulnerable age group. 
So we want to know that the vaccine also works in the vulnerable age group. This is very important. So uh, the trials, the phase two, phase three trials are very important. But the other importance is that they test it out in all the age groups, especially the vulnerable age groups, to make sure that the vaccine is working and it is of long duration. And now, Dr. Ko, of course, as uh, Dr. Pankanya just mentioned, there have been various efforts. Um, vaccine developers are trying, are starting to recruit volunteers to test their drugs. They have been doing so for the past few months. And of course, this is something that really can't be taken lightly. And there was recently a scare after a volunteer of AstraZeneca's phase three trial died in Brazil. So there are growing worries. And what are then the possible health implications if things do go wrong? And are there specific groups of people who shouldn't undergo trials or may not necessarily develop immunity? Well, thank you, Su-Young, for that uh, question. And, and, and let me break that up into two parts. So I think the first part is, is that, you know, there is preliminary good news. Uh, these, uh, may, you know, many of these vaccines are a good number have already gone through what we call phase one and phase two trials. These are done on smaller numbers of patients and they haven't shown severe adverse reactions, you know, kind of warning, warning signs. However, there's a big challenge. You know, this is a new virus. Uh, this is, it's always difficult to make a vaccine against a new virus and you can have an unexpected problem uh, that could go on. It's hard to predict actually what could go wrong. You could have rare complications such as severe allergic uh, reactions. And I think there, there are several safeguards, you know, that are being placed in the clinical trial protocol, you know, throughout the world by regulatory agencies. And that's testing them in these larger phase three trials. These are trials with 30,000 people, 60,000 people. And so that you can evaluate if these, these vaccines can give, you know, perhaps potentially adverse reactions, if they're serious, and also if they're rare and how rare they would be that could help identify really the policy decisions about whether these vaccines should be used or not. I think in the second question is, is that, and this goes back to Dr. Pankanya's explanation, there are many different types of vaccines and they may have uh, contraindications or they may not be acceptable in certain groups of the population. For example, the live vaccines, these are vaccines which are done with weakened viruses or what we call attenuated viruses. Um, we wouldn't want to give those types of vaccines to people who are potentially immunocompromised or immunosuppressed um, because of chemotherapy for cancer. Uh, on the other hand, and this is, you know, the importance of having different types of vaccines and testing them for such, a, such an important public health problem in this uh, you know, em you know, emergency situation of a pandemic, so that we have a vaccine that can work at broadly against various groups of the population and work to be effective as well as safe. And in that regard, Dr. Ko, then how can we ensure that the vaccine works for as many people as possible in the population? I mean, including all ethnic minorities, especially in a country where you are now, a country as diverse as America. Well, that's the importance of the clinical trials in recruiting this diverse population within a country, but also between countries. I'll give you a good example. Uh, the measles, the initial measles vaccine is probably one of the greatest public health victories that we've had in the last 40, 50 years. Uh, that vaccine actually worked well in, for example, U.S. and European populations, but it actually was associated with severe adverse reactions in the native, you know, uh, American uh, indigenous population when they were tested in, in Brazil. So testing them not just within a country like the United States, but testing them throughout different groups is essential, essential and critical in the um, in the uh, vaccine evaluation process. And now, Dr. Pankani, now countries around the world they're starting to form their vaccine strategies, how they're going to roll out this to the population. Which group should be first in line to get it, and then after that, who would come next? Well, uh, it is important to get it right with regards to um, who you're going to immunize first. And obviously the target group should be the old, the vulnerable, the people who, if they were to get a real coronavirus infection, would suffer severe illness. And then the other group that we also need to protect is frontline people. So this would be doctors, nurses, police, 
fire brigade, ambulance, those sort of people who are also dealing with other human beings all the time, every time, every day. And then, therefore, once you've uh, immunized your main target group, you can extend that net slowly and carefully. But one more thing with respect to strategy, and this is really, really important, especially for the rich nations, is that you do not live in your own solitary bubble. So the United States, Europe, the rich countries don't necessarily live in their own bubble. They need to support the efforts of the World Health Organization to also immunize people in other countries, the poorer countries, and actually fund it, provide logistics support, provide assistance to other countries to also have a good immunization program simultaneously. It shouldn't be one after the other. It should be at the same time because we are in it together. If we want to make it better for planet Earth, we do it together. So it really needs to be for the uh, universal good, I suppose, and for the whole world. We shouldn't be exclusive about this. And well, now, Dr. Dr. Ko, so there are also some distribution concerns as well, how the vaccine is going to be uh, distributed across the nation, especially in one as large as the United States. The, 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 logistic of it, the logistics of it is raising some concerns as well. How do you think authorities should prepare for that? Well, I, I think um, Dr. Pankanya said a, an, ex, uh, an, an extremely important point, which is the issue of equity. Um, this We know this is a vaccine which crosses borders, crosses populations, crosses different groups. So unless we not only produce enough to, for, for all the populations and leaving no person behind with these vaccines and not only and also distributing it to all segments of society. And there's several challenges here um, you know, with, with respect to the distribution. Some of the vaccines are going to uh, require two doses, right? And in many of the countries and probably the majority of countries of the world, actually don't have the infrastructure for a mass vaccination campaign. I'll give you a good example of the United States here. There are very few vaccines that we actually give out in a mass vaccine campaign. Influenza is one example, but that's only one of very, very few. The second part is that some of the vaccines that are being produced, uh, Dr. Pankanya had mentioned the mRNA type of vaccine that's being produced by Moderna and, uh, and, uh, and Pfizer. That vaccine is going to require freezers, which are not just the regular freezers that we, we use in, you know, for our daily appliances, but they're going to require deep freeze freezers, freezers that go to minus 80 degrees. That's going to be a big challenge, not only for the United States, but that's going to be a big challenge when we're thinking about issues of equity. And now this question goes to both of you. I mean, of course, there is still great uncertainty over when a vaccine will become available, but uh, politicians like President Donald Trump, even a few weeks ago, he was claiming there could be an October surprise. And of course, over in the UK, people were cautiously hoping for a Christmas surprise. Do you think these kind of statements or optimistic timelines really help public morale? Or what do you think would be a more realistic time frame? Uh, why don't we start with you, uh, Dr. Pankanya? Well, as a doctor, I always tell my medical students, um, always be measured always be honest and always uh, lead and don't have any other agenda items. So politicians are politicians. They will say and do what they prefer to do as it suits them. But as public health professionals, we have a duty to be honest, truthful and measured. And, and therefore, uh, if you want to take the people with you, it is better to say, look, we are developing it, we are testing it, We've got the results coming, but we're not sure. And, and, you know, lead the people rather than mislead the people or give people false hope. It's very important to get the messaging right. And your thoughts on this, Dr. K? Well, I, I think there's an important, uh, two important words when we're thinking about something like vaccine and when we're also thinking about public health safety. And that's trust and being trustworthy. I'm going to paraphrase... Uh, a friend and colleague of mine, Professor Mark Litzich, what we need is evidence-based policy. We don't need to create policy-based evidence. We're seeing the politics around vaccines, you know, with in being used as a political political tool, and that undermines the issues of trust and trustworthiness. Well, 
I'm afraid we're going to have to wrap up the discussion here, but that was Dr. Bharat Pankania, Senior Clinical Lecturer at the University of Exeter Medical School, and Dr. Albert Coe, Professor of Epidemiology and Medicine at Yale School of Public Health. Thank you both so much for your incredible insights. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you. And to our viewers, thank you as always for watching and for starting your week with us. We'll be back tomorrow with more global insights on issues making headlines. Have a great day or evening wherever you are. Goodbye.